Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Kennebec Valley Baptist Church. We're glad you're here. We always start off our morning with a few announcements to call to your attention. Right now we're going through our faith promise um, of, of collecting cards from everybody, understanding how much we're going to be allocating towards missions. So, um, so far, praise the Lord, we've had uh, a pretty good showing of getting some information and, and starting to plan, uh, but we're still well short of what that goal is. So if you're planning on giving um, on a weekly basis dedicated to, to missions, we need to know about that. So if you could please fill out the form, put it in the collection plate, so we can start allocating those funds from our budget accordingly. This evening for the evening service, Beth Fisher will be here from CRU, so please come and join us for the evening service. And we've been praying for a, how, probably a couple of months now about the ladies' retreat. Well, it's here already. It's next Saturday, so it's coming up very quickly. Um, so a couple of things about that. We're still looking for the church body to help with some breakfast foods. So there's a sign-up sheet on the back table. And uh, also, if you wanted to just donate money towards the breakfast foods, you can do that also. So please note that on that sign-up sheet so we can make plans. And also this evening, just remember about the prayer time, the dedicated prayer time from 5.30 to 5.55 before evening service, uh, dedicated towards praying for that. And for our ladies here, our own body, that are coming for the ladies' retreat, and if you're okay with a little extra walking, uh, we usually we run out of parking. We end up parking up on the street and everything else. So if you could, behind the office, park this year behind the office, and then uh, Dick Rendell and, and Bill Dolan will be here to help you. Um, but that would just help save some parking spots for these other ladies that are coming that are guests to be able to park closer to the building. So if you could do that, that would be a, a very big help as we're expecting a large crowd once again. Um, the Shepherd's Godparents Home will be visiting the church in November. It's November 15th, about a month away. And they have a full house. And right now they are in need of baby items. So this is something that... When you're at the store, even picking up a package of diapers to be able to drop them off, or some wipes, things like that, it'll really help because what we're looking to do is collect a bunch of these items so when they come speak here, we could fill up their vehicles and be a blessing to them with all of these needs that they have. So I want to thank Tabby Cole. Uh, she's the one who's spearheading this, so if you could uh, just see Tabby. And we're going to be collecting items until November 8th because we want to see the volume, because some of these are bulky items that we'll be collecting, that way they can plan accordingly so they can get them back to the godparents' home. So we're excited to be able to contribute in that way. Also up back, there's a sign-up sheet for 3 by 3 Fellowship. It's about couples getting together with other folks and, and enjoying a meal, game time, and just getting to know each other and, and having our circle of friends grow uh, even more. So that's kind of the goal of what we're trying to do here. Um, we're going to start to draw some names and, and pair some folks up starting November 1st. So if you could please sign up on that sheet out back about the 3x3 three, three three Fellowship, it'll be a blessing. Also, there's a, a quick little note I want to read to you. It says, Dear KBBC family, we want to express our heartfelt thanks for the generous gifts and words of encouragement during Pastor Appreciation Sunday. We have been blessed beyond words to serve here with you for 23 plus years. May God continue to use us together to accomplish his purpose, love in Christ, Pastor Kevin and Connie. So um, truly was great to pause and to take a little bit of time to show our appreciation. Um, I know that's not what Pastor Kevin and Connie are about, and I know it's a little uncomfortable even that Sunday, um, but we're following scripture to honor those who are uh, in service on us. So we praise you for getting involved in that. and. Uh, and they wanted to make sure that you, they do sincerely appreciate that. I think that's all the announcements I have today. Okay, seems like that would be all. Uh, if you're a guest, we're glad you're here. We would like you to feel welcome, and we'd also like to get you a package of information about our church. So as you're leaving today, just see one of the men, and they can gladly give you some information about the church. So let's greet our guests, and let's greet each other this morning. <laughs>
sing together this morning. Oh God, you are my God, and I will ever praise you. My thoughts lately have been drawn a lot to worry. I'm married to a worrier. I'm a worrier. So the two of us are quite a team. And it's not so much worrying about living and life and health. It's just the day-to-day -day grind of what are we going to do next? How are we going to get all this done? You know, instead of depending on God to hold on to us, and just letting go of it all. And I think with what Pastor's been talking about, it's been really speaking to me, how big is my view of God if I'm worried about tomorrow? If I'm worried about what I'm going to eat or what I'm going to wear or where we're going to go or how we're going to get stuff done, do I have a big view of God? Or am I compartmentalizing Him? So I, I've been thinking about that, and I think we do need to have that big view of God. God is huge. And if he can take care of this world and manage it and, and take care of keeping the day-to-day -day life of, world, of this world moving, can he handle my simple life? It's not all that complicated. So I've got a few verses I'd like to read this morning, and uh, I hope that they speak to you the way they've kind of spoken to me today. If you all stand, please. Philippians 4, verses 6 through 7, Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Proverbs 3, verses 5 through 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. And then John 14, verse 27. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You may be seated. A lot of it, lean not on our own understanding, but trust in God. And I think if we all do that, the worries of life will fade and our attention will be put where it needs to be. We're going to take a few moments of silent prayer and meditation to prepare our hearts for service this morning. And then pastor will open us up in public prayer.
care and things in our life that we ought to give to you, we give it to you, and then we take it back. Father, we simply need to come to you with empty, with empty hands. <coughs> We're thankful that we have been commanded to cast our care upon you because you care for us. And we thank you for your love this morning. And we thank that you have a plan that you want to complete and full. And uh, Lord, not only can we trust you with our eternity, but we can trust you with our tomorrow. Mm-hmm. So Father, we pray that it be our plan this week as we live. Father, we have a busy week. And we pray for the activities. I know this week there is going to be a lot of last minute planning and preparation for ladies' retreats. And Father, we just wanted today on Saturday that we could glorify you and minister to the many ladies that are going to be here. Father, we have other activities this week. And again, we want to ask your blessing upon them. We want them to be more than just activities. We want them to be ministry events, Father. And so, Father, you what is going to happen in our lives this week corporately and individually to advance the kingdom. Father, as we come here this morning, we want our worship to be acceptable as we continue to talk about discipleship. Help us, Lord, what it really means to live an authentic life. Continue to teach us about separation and holiness, Father. And again, this begins with a proper view of you. Father, we are a blessed people. We praise you because we know and we acknowledge that you are the source of all blessings. And so, Lord, I pray this morning that we be very mindful of your presence, that you're always with us as we worship together. We ask these things, my Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I ask you all grab your hymnals. Let's open up to number 563, count your blessings, and we will sing verses 1, 2, and 4. all together on Wednesday night and got my message from Mike this morning about uh, doing scripture reading so it's kind of funny how that all played together not my plan I'm not that smart let's go right into our next chorus this morning more love more power I will worship you with all of my heart. 
and I will worship you with all of my mind. I will worship you with all of my strength. You are my Lord. You are my Lord. And I will worship you with all of my heart. And I will worship you with all of my mind. I will that he is your Lord this morning. At this time, we're going to be blessed with special music from Miss Alexis Schools. Good morning. So, I was... I had this big, huge, like, speech planned before I was going to sing this song. And then I started to get a little nervous as I was sitting in the pew. But what I wanted to share was I've been thinking about singing this song for, a, well, since softball season. And uh, Rick and I were talking about it. And I was like, I'll tackle that one. So as I started thinking about the words of this song, I couldn't help but think about a friend of ours who just shared his journey uh, with uh, the bondage that he was in and how uh, a little book that I've read and my husband has read that he read and as I thought about the words this song goes hand in hand uh, with what he was saying about being set free so uh, I hope that you all are blessed and that you all know that uh, <laughs> that Jesus did die for all of us, for you and me, and to break us from that bondage that uh, Satan has put into our lives or made us think about uh, so very often. So I think I'm ready.
Thank you, Alexis. Very well done. A lot of message in that song. I remember driving down the highway at about 65 miles an hour, bawling my eyes out the first time I heard it. A lot of truth. Our lives are useless and pointless without his death and resurrection. So thank you very much. Let's grab our hymnals. Let's open up to number 521, Redeemed. We will sing verses 1, 3, and 4. And if the men would come on that final chorus this morning, please. Thanks for all that you've done for us, Father, and we just ask that you bless this offering, Father, and that we be able to give back uh, what you've so richly already given us, Father. We just ask that we'd give a little back, Father, and we just thank you, Father, for all you've done. We ask you bless it in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Our final chorus this morning will be, There's Something About That Name. And let's sing this as, it, as it's written. The words of this song are beautiful. It's an old chorus that's been around for a lot of years. But if you focus on the words as we sing them this morning, it maybe it'll give you some new meaning. Thank you. 
Lord, we do thank you that there is something special about your name. Lord, that you were willing to give it all. You gave your life on a cross for our sins. Lord, you sacrificed everything, your kingdom, your throne, and your crown for us. Lord, we praise you that you made that choice and you were willing to die for our sins. Lord, I pray that we would all be willing to live for you daily. Draw us closer to you. Use us, Lord, as your instruments. Be with the pastor, Lord, as he comes this morning. Speak to us through him. Help him to bring forward the words that you've laid on his heart. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Fogler and Junior Church, you are dismissed. In recent days, we have been talking about discipleship as Jesus mentions it in Luke chapter 9, which is the beginning of the third year of the public ministry. And we've been looking at the, the qualifications uh, of discipleship, having this authentic life with Christ. And has Christ redeemed us to change our eternity? Yes. But he also has redeemed us to change us in time. And so the first qualification of discipleship was humility. We spent a good portion of the summer looking at that. Second qualification, the one we've been looking at the last several weeks, is that of cross-bearing. And the key is that when Jesus makes this statement about taking up your cross daily, is that it is a year before the crucifixion. The cross has not yet become the beloved symbol of Christianity that it is today. And so within that context, the picture that came into the minds of the disciples was a condemned prisoner carrying the patubulum, the cross piece of the cross, to their place of execution. And that's exactly the image that the Lord wanted. That's why he used that very powerful symbol. Because to us, we would say, well, why wouldn't Jesus mention the cross? But again, we are looking back through 2,000 years of history. It is a dreaded implement of execution and torture within the context of Luke 9. The spiritual truth that Christ here, a prisoner carrying the cross piece was distinct. They stuck out like the proverbial sore thumb. And that's what Christ is suggesting to us spiritually. If Jesus is in our lives, we are distinct. We are different. And we are, those of us who have Christ and are taking our lives seriously are different from those who don't have him. And we have suggested that that is what our world has lost. That's what we've lost in our culture. And it probably began in the last 50 or 60 years, but there's been the gap that once existed between the church and culture has continued to shrink. And I wonder in the 21st century how much of a gap there is, and I wonder if the line is even disappearing. And beloved, something has to be done. And it might as well begin with us, right? We've noted this ties in with a broader concept of holiness, in that the root word for holiness means to separate. It literally meant to cut something, and then that which was cut was separate from that from which it was cut. And so a cut apart or a cut above, uh, to transcend, to exceed usual limits, to climb across, if you will. And so holiness is purity, but it's more than purity. It's that God is separate from the creation. There is this infinite distance between the creator and the creation. Now, he's not aloof. He's very interested in what's going on. But he is separate. The source of holiness has declared and has the right to declare other things that are holy. And we are on the list as his people. Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 2 that we are a holy people. 
when something was declared holy by the author of holiness within the scripture, it meant that it was no longer common. And we are no longer common. We are separate. We are distinct. And even in 1 Peter chapter 1, which has been our secondary base camp, because this is the first place in the epistle that Peter mentions holiness. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of life or conversation, because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. That's our command. That is the product of salvation. And that's the theme of 1 Peter 1. In verse 3 through verse 9, he praises salvation. Verse 10, 11, and 12, it is the prophetic aspect of salvation. And then verse 13 through verse 16 is the product. What should this marvelous thing that God hath wrought, what should be the result of it in the lives of those who have embraced it? And holiness should be the result. We should be separate. We should be distinct. And beloved, there probably is no more direct correlation in all of the word of God between God's character and our conduct than in those two verses. We are a holy people. Now, we have attempted in the last couple of weeks, and we'll continue today, to deal with some nuts and bolts about this. We'll get into the trenches, because this appears to be a spiritual mission impossible. You don't deny holiness. You don't deny that it exists. You believe that other people can attain it but not you. And that's what the enemy wants you to think. But notice there are no special categories there. Everyone is included in that. But that's one of the lies of the enemy. And he's very good at telling that lie. We also hear the lie that Pharaoh suggested to Moses way back in Exodus 8. Don't go very far away. What a persuasive lie. He didn't say don't be a Christian. He didn't say incorporate polytheism into your belief system. He said don't get crazy on us. Don't get radical about this. Stay close. And you heard that lie this week. And we've been hearing it for a long time in our culture now. And so is holiness possible? And if it is, how do we accomplish it? Well, That's what he talks about in the first two verses, in verse 13 and 14, when he begins to talk about the product of salvation. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. That has been our focal point in the last couple of weeks. Again, it is about the mind. It is about your gray matter. It is about your brain. Our cognitive thinking skills distinguish us as image bearers. It is one of the things that makes us unique. It reflects the fact that we are the pinnacle of creation. And I think, again, the enemy doesn't want us to understand the importance of the mind. He wants us to be emotionally driven. He wants us to be activity driven. And we'll talk about that last week. There have been times in your life, beloved, you have said, I am going to change. Good for you. But you didn't reprogram your mind, and it didn't last very long, did it? And there's a reason for that. The mind is the core. The mind is the key because of the direct correlation, the direct link between Scripture, between truth and our minds. Your mind must be primed. It must be prepared with the Word of God. And I would suggest to you, we are a culture that is losing our minds. I would suggest the overall intelligence quota within our culture today, is dropping. Literacy rates are dropping. Reading levels are dropping. And I think there's a spiritual agenda behind it. Satan is a big fan of ignorance. Because when you can keep people in intellectual darkness, you can control them. I did some reading this week, folks, just to see if I was, you know, an old dinosaur or not. And I am, but I'm not off on this one. SAT scores have steadily declined since the 50s. Check it out. 
In our educational system today, children, students, receive national testing at three times in their academic careers. Elementary school, middle school, and in high school. And then those test scores are compared to all the other you know, countries in the world that are the equivalent to ours. In elementary school, our American children are at the top. At middle school, they're equal to the rest of the world. In high school, they're under the rest of the world. Which seems to point to the longer you stay in school, kids, the less you learn, OK? <laughs> and so, you know, hunting season's coming. Just take the month of November off. How's that? And I'm not trying to bust public education. And I am thankful for the believers in public education who are taking it seriously and you know, view it as their mission field. Wow, do we need you? But when you throw God, who is the foundation of knowledge, out of your school system, as we did in 1962 and 1963, there are ramifications. Because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Period. That's either true or that is false. Isn't it? Our minds are so essential. And that's why I'm thankful for Sunday school. That's why I am thankful for our youth program. That's one reason why I've been a big fan of Awana down through the ages, in that it gets the word of God into young minds. And that's what it needs. But it's all about the mind. Now, we're told specifically here to do something with our mind, with our noose, N-O-U-S. We're to gird it up cultural phrase that everyone within that culture knew. Uh, if you missed last week, you, you missed the fancy wardrobe thing that I had. Sorry, it was a one-time deal only, all right? You aren't going to catch me in a dress often, okay? I usually do it at home in the closet. How's that? But anyway, <clears throat> and it's probably on YouTube because that's how insidious Dennis is. So, but in that day and age, where both genders wore robes, very pragmatic, until strenuous activity was involved, or you needed to run somewhere, or you were involved in combat, or fighting, or something. And so you would take the loose folds of your robe, you would pull it up to shin or to knee level, and you would take the folds and flop them over your belt. Now, here is the common denominator of all of that activity. Something was going to happen. And a great translation, then, of this first phrase is this. Prepare your mind for action. Prepare your mind for action. And if, no doubt, we all have been involved with something that we weren't mentally ready for, it, were we? You have heard someone say, my mind wasn't in it. You've heard someone say, I went brain dead. Mm -hmm. In athletes, athletics, which is a, a big part of our culture, you have seen athletes, we use the phrase, they didn't show up. Well, physically they were there, weren't they? But who knows where their mind was, because that wasn't there. You have seen a coach, after an athlete does something stupid, standing there going, mm, 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 you know, yeah, what does that mean? Think! That's what it means. You've known an athlete that they ooze talent, sickening, but they didn't have the mind to go with their talent. They weren't mentally tough. You could mess with their heads. You could get inside their mind. You could psych them out. Some people are good at it. Some people thrive on it, OK? Yeah. Because if you can beat somebody mentally, you don't even have to beat them on the field. And people like that, they always have an, an excuse of why they lose. There's always a reason why they lose. And sometimes they look for reasons to lose because it just it helps you deal with the, the disappointment, if you will. And beloved, here's the key thought. It is time for God's people to show up. It is simply time for God's people to get our heads in the game, period. Far too long, we've not had our head in the game. 
We need to gird up the loins of our minds. And Christianity demands a mental toughness. I know you don't hear that. I know our culture doesn't portray it that way. I know that our culture talks about, you know, you're, you're weak-minded or check your brains at the door, right? You've heard that one. Or you're anti-intellectual. Those are all lies of the enemy. Nothing could be further from the truth. Now, thankfully, mental toughness is not something we have to conjure up on our own. You know, as a kid, I, mental toughness was beat into me, if you will, okay? And not that my dad beat me, but he, he wanted me to be mentally tough. And I was, he was only just over 21 after I was born. There's not a big gap between us. And I can remember growing up, he was in great shape, and we'd go out and play in the driveway and stuff like that, and play basketball, play pickup on a gravel driveway, and I'd start to win when I got better. And, you know, my dad would knock me down in the driveway. Yeah. You say, that's mean. Nope, didn't hurt me a bit, okay? My mother picked gravel out of my knees on so many occasions, it wasn't even funny. How's that? Didn't hurt me a bit. But this, this mental toughness, if you will, was something that I grew up around. You want to see someone who can mess with somebody's head, you want to watch Dr. Calder do it. I mean, the man is good. He is scary good. <laughs> Nobody should be that good. Yeah, and he was my pastor, and I played pickup basketball with him, too. And I mean, you know, it almost make him break down in tears, okay? My word. Yeah, I was surrounded by a bunch of, you know, nutcases, if you will, when it came to mental toughness. But it didn't hurt me a bit. Spiritually, we don't have to conjure up our own mental toughness. God doesn't expect us to do that. And so what is the key to girding up the loins of our mind? Beloved, it's your relationship with the truth. It's all about the word, is what it is. There are no secrets here. Because again, there is that, the mind and the word, there is this, you've been hardwired. There's this direct wiring between your mind and the Word of God. Now, I am going to tell you the secret to having a relationship with the Word of God. Spend time with it. That's all you have to do. All relationships require time. The Word of God requires time. And as you spend time, time with, and that's I know that's the one thing we don't have none of us have enough time but I don't care how busy you are your time with the Word of God must be a priority and when you start reading the Word of God in large chunks it will change you trust me early in my ministry Again, because God takes care of the ignorant, and I've had a lot of good people placed in my life at the right time of my life. When I first got into ministry, I had someone I really respected and who was a biblical genius say to me, you need to start reading through the Word of God once a year. And I've been doing it now for the last three decades. It is the single most important thing I do in my relationship with the Scripture. And there are a number of good reading programs out there. And I know it seems overwhelming, but over a course of 365 days, depending on how many pages there are in your Bible, sometimes it's only six or seven pages a day and probably won't take you any more than 20 minutes. And there isn't any, more, any better investment of your time. There are reading programs out there. I have never encountered a bad one. They're all good. It's just, you know, your style or something like that. Some of you have a lot of windshield time. I'd get a copy of the Word of God on, on a recording if I were you. Some of you are audio learners, the same thing. And in 15 or 20 minutes a day, in your commute, in your windshield time, you, you can listen to the Word of God probably more than once. And so have somebody read it to you. That's cool. Read it yourself. But you've got to spend time with the Word. And it changes us. 
I was thinking of a, a passage of scripture that would just really make this concrete. And the first one was Psalm 119, which is a psalm about the word of God and everything that it does. But it's 176 verses. And so who knows how long that would take. But read it sometime through that perspective, beloved. The benefits of having a relationship with the Word. Because that's what the psalm is about. But we need something a little more compact and economical. And so let's go to one of the more familiar passages in the Scripture, on the Scripture, which is 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. You know this verse, you have memorized this verse, you have heard this verse. Please don't allow familiarity to breed contempt. Number one, we have the origin of Scripture. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. So we know that the book that we have been blessed with is of more than human nature. And inspiration there, the only time it's used in the Greek language, God breathed. The Holy Spirit of God worked through, breathed through the human authors. They did not become robots. They did not lose their personalities. They, they didn't get superior grammatical skills if they didn't have any. Peter's an example of that. In the original Greek, First and Second Peter are a grammatical horror show because the guy was a fisherman. So the Holy Spirit just didn't all of a sudden give him these great gr grammatical skills, if you will. These men were not robots. The Spirit of God worked through their personality, but in the original text, the product was exactly what God intended. And so we believe, or in what we call today, plebal, uh, excuse me, verbal, plenary inspiration of the Word of God. That the very words are inspired. I know it's one of the great debates. I know it's something our culture attacks. Where did the Bible come from? This is not a smart aleck answer, but it's a very simple answer. The Bible came from previous Bibles. That's where the Bible came from. There is a, a continual line of Bibles down through human history and there is continuity. And we saw that, we see that, even with the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls in the middle part of the 20th century. No discrepancies at all between the Dead Sea Scrolls and the co English copies of the Word of God that we have today. What a phenomenal thing. And again, the miraculous preservation of the Word of God is one of the proofs that it is the Word of God. So the origin of the Scripture is... God. We have what God wants us to have. Now, so that's the origin. Now, because of its origin, what is the outcome? And is profitable. How many times have you read that word? How many times have you heard that word? But have you ever focused on what it means? That's the key. There are some unique things about this word. For example, have you ever done something and it wasn't profitable? You have. You ever wasted time? Yep, you have. Ever had a project go south on you? You have. Ever invested money and lost it? You have. Yeah, glad I'm not the only one, okay? That's what he's getting at here, if you love it. One of the unique things about this word, it is the last word in the Greek alphabet. That doesn't mean it's not an important word. I guess somebody has to be last, but it's the last word. And that I was just curious when I discovered that, and I didn't know, so I thought, what is the last word then in the English alphabet? And it's Zymergy. Z-Y-M-E-R-G-Y. You can't get much further down the line than ZY, can you? Zymergy is the branch of chemistry that deals with fermentation. Now, to me, fermentation is a large enough word. 
But you know how you science people are. Or as our dear brother Carol would say, that's when the cider began to kick in, okay? <laughs> and if you don't know what that means, good for you. And if you'd like to know what it means, you can talk to Carol after service. How's that? But Zymergy, and that has nothing to do with a sermon. I'm just feeling benevolent this morning. So this is the last word in the Greek alphabet and in Greek vocabulary. It come, it's an economic word, and the root means to accumulate. Well, that's a good word for profit, isn't it? Profit is what you accumulate. By the way, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with being profitable. There's nothing wrong with making money. It ought not to be a master, but making profit is a biblical thing. And I will say this this morning for no extra charge because I'm feeling benevolent in that socialism, any culture that has adopted socialism has never thrived. I am very concerned all of a sudden how a majority of the American people are falling in love with socialism. Complete stupidity. And the core and the major problem with socialism is that it is not biblical. Period. And yeah, the scripture talks about economics. That's how complete the word of God is. God's system is free enterprise. That is the only way people will prosper. And so Paul is using this economic word. He is saying to accumulate. Now, as he's using it here, it's the idea of advantageous. Ever been in a situation where you had the advantage? That's a good thing, isn't it? Ever been in a situation where you didn't have the advantage? Paul is saying it is advantageous, it is profitable for this to happen. Now, here's something else about this word that makes it unique. It is only used by the Apostle Paul. It is only used in the pastoral epistles. That's the only place where, of the 13 that he writes, he only uses it, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. He only uses it once in each of the epistles. And so in 1 Timothy, he tells us godliness is profitable. It is to your advantage to be godly. And no doubt because that ties in to holiness. You are separate. You are distinct when there is godliness in your life. In Titus, he tells us good works are profitable. It is to your advantage as an outcome of your Christianity to be involved in good works, to be serving why? You grow your world. That is how you influence other people. In 2 Timothy, he tells us the scripture. It is to your advantage to have a relationship with the word of God. It is profitable. You're not wasting your time. You're not wasting your effort when you spend that 20 minutes a day with the word of God going through it. You're going to begin to accumulate things. You're going to begin to develop the advantage when that happens. Now, what will begin to happen? Well, he's very specific. And again, beloved, we're so familiar with these things, and we go through them so quickly sometimes, I think it's as if we think Paul is filling a word quarter. Remember when you took your, your freshman writing class, either in high school or, or college, and if I were a writing instructor, I would do away with page quotes. Vote for me. And here's why. They don't produce good writers. Do they? Because if a student, a professor assigns a five-page paper, what's your concern? Doing the five pages. And you get to the top of that fifth page and you're saying, wow, man, am I there now? And it makes us wordy is what it does. Remember, use excess words, and that's not what good communicators do. Good communicators put the right word in the right place. And so this is what I used to do, you know. It was a, a dark, rainy, stormy, wind-driven, black, 
bone chilling, miserable night. Yay! And I filled up a whole, you know, I, I took a whole line. And then I turned the paper in, and the red pen came out. I don't even think red pens are politically correct today. I think it's probably way too violent, okay? And, you know, scratch, 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 scratch. And the teacher wrote down, Wordy. I used to hate that. I had my five pages, cut me some slack. I think sometimes when we read the scripture, we think, oh, they're being wordy. You know, God had a page quota, and that's what the authors are doing. Paul is not filling up a page quota here. He is not simply saying the same thing four times. Every one of these things is different. You know what the common denominator is? All four are profitable. So when he says it's profitable for doctrine, doctrine is what is right. We need to know what's right. The scripture tells us what's right. Truth reveals what is right. And in your time with the word of God, what is right is going to be revealed to you. Second category for reproof. Reproof is what isn't right. And so the scripture will tell me what I should be doing. It's also going to tell me what I shouldn't be doing. And beloved, you know, we think of, of reproof here. Again, it's a specific word. And it's the idea of within the context of instruction. So you've been learning how to do something before. And your mentor, your teacher, whoever it was, says to you, they stop you in the middle of it. And they say, no, 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 don't look. It's better to do it this way. You understand what I'm talking about? That's what a reproof is there. God says, look, it's better to do it this way. The scripture points out what isn't right for correction. Correction is how to get right. Because there are going to be times when we all do something wrong. God doesn't give up on us. God doesn't throw us away. Aren't you thankful for that? He tells us how to get right. The scripture is going to show you how to get back on track for instruction and righteousness. That is how to stay right. You can live a consistent, victorious Christian experience. And that's what was shared with us in music this morning. You can be delivered. This falling back, this continually struggling with something, beloved, it is contrary to what the truth reveals. More than just a word quota. Aren't you glad? More than just taking up space. He is being very specific. A, a, a relationship with the word of God is advantageous. And it is advantageous because of those four things. And that's pretty much what life is all about, isn't it? Now to refine this. We go to another passage that you're very familiar with that ties into the Word of God. So when these four things, and notice that the man of God may be perfect, that's not morally perfect, but may be complete. Notice, the adverb, thoroughly furnished. Not just partially, not even just 99%. Thoroughly furnished, furnished or equipped unto all good works. And so godliness is profitable, good works are profitable, and the scripture is profitable. Now, here's what we do with our relationship with the scripture. Go over to 2 Corinthians. Keep in mind the challenges in the Corinthian church. In the first century Greek world, Corinth was New York, it was L.A., it was Paris, it was one of the major metropolitan areas in the empire, there was wealth. It was a port city. There's athletics. The, there was an athletic stadium in Corinth. I believe it held 55,000 people. They could play an NFL game there this afternoon. That's a pretty good sized stadium, isn't it? The Corinthian games were the, the warm ups, if you will, the prelude to the Olympic games. But Corinth, beloved, like major, many of our metropolitan areas today, was a mess. Idol worship, 
Family is broken down. Marriage is broken down. People have problems with alcoholism. They have problems with drugs. And, and again, it is a horror show. And as the gospel goes in there, and to begin to change people, separation was one of the things that the Corinthian church struggled with. And particularly, it's one of the things that Paul addresses in 1 Corinthians. And he talks about, you're carnal. You aren't separate. He, you know, they're, they're priding themselves on having tolerance for a moral situation that should have never have been. Paul said, this is wrong. There were abuses at the Lord's table. See, they are dealing with what our culture is dealing with today. And so in his second epistle, you're very familiar with verse 14, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. You're familiar with that verse. We often use that in a, a romance, a marital context, don't we? That someone who is in Christ should not marry someone who is outside of Christ. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's true. It's, it's going to be a heartbreak. But it goes beyond that. It's talking about you know, business partnerships. Again, a yoke, entering into a partnership with someone. You ought to be on the same page. And if you aren't on the same page, it isn't going to work out. And then he, he builds his argument in verse 15 and 16. Then his conclusion in verse 17. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye, again, separate. See, there's our key concept, beloved. Because what is holiness? It is a biblical separation, saith the Lord. Now, separate here, beloved, in the Greek is the concept of a boundary line. You know what a boundary line is? It distinguishes a piece of property. Properties need boundary lines because a piece ends here, and then the next parcel continues, and everything. You need mental boundary lines. And you know what extra biblical term we use today to describe those? Your convictions. Your convictions are your boundary lines. And just as they distinguish a piece of property, that it ends here, then the next piece starts here, and everything in here is within this parcel, your convictions, your boundary lines make you distinct. And without them, there's no distinction. Without them, who knows what you'll end up doing. Because sometimes today, you know, biblical separation is a lot of confusion. I don't think there's any accident to that. The enemy wants it to be confusion. And there's abuses in, in both ditches. So, you know, in some instances we see no biblical separation. In some places we see things that claim to be biblical separation, but they're, they aren't. Biblical separation, again... It's your boundaries. Do you have boundaries? And the only way to have boundaries is to have a relationship with the book. Because the book is profitable. And it will give you your boundaries. Now here's a key thing about your boundaries. You need to have them before you get to Egypt. And Joseph's a great example of that. Before Joseph you know, gets done dirty by his brothers and gets dumped into Egypt at age 17, he had boundaries, didn't he? He determined what he was going to do. He determined what he wasn't going to do. And the same thing is true of us today. You have to have your boundaries before you get into Egypt. Because if you don't, Egypt is going to chew you up and spit you out. You young people, before you leave home, you need to have your boundaries. Before you go out on Friday night, you need to have boundaries. Men, we have to have our boundaries before we go to work tomorrow morning. We've got to have our boundaries. And you've got to have them before you get into a place 
that is going to test your boundaries, which in this culture is about everywhere, isn't it? Yep. We need to have our lines. But biblical boundaries require relationship with the Scripture. And so that's where our mental toughness comes from. That 20 minutes a day with the Scripture is going to give you your mental toughness. Your mind will be prepared for action. You say it sounds way too simple. Number one, what's wrong with simple? Aren't you glad it's not hard? There's nothing in Christianity that's hard, really. God makes it simple, and I'm thankful that he does. It's interesting, beloved. Guys, can I have the 13 and 14 again? This is where we're headed next week. So the first step in pursuing personal holiness is to prepare my mind for action. Okay? We're done with that. Now again, it's like he's filling a word quote. It's like he's repeating himself. Be sober. He isn't, beloved. Here, Peter is talking about now you're ready for action. He isn't talking about walking around and being stern. He isn't talking about sobriety, although that's where the root word comes from. He's talking about action. But here's the key, beloved, to Christianity. We are changed from the inside out. We are not changed from the outside in. And until your mind is prepared, there's no action. That is the problem with rule-oriented Christianity. There's no permanent change because the mind hasn't been trained or prepared to change. And so we'll talk about that next week. But with a mind that is prepared for action, now you're ready to get in the game. Just as an athlete who has mentally prepared is ready for the kickoff, for the buzzer to go off, or, you know, whatever the case might be. But it's our relationship with the Scripture, folks. Father, thank you for the miraculous gift of the Word of God. We praise you, Father, that we can have a relationship with this precious book. Father, the enemy wants to complicate it. He wants to tell us that it's not possible that yeah other people can do it but we can't he wants us to tell us that we don't have time or all these other things Lord Father it's all just a myth simply spending less than a half hour a day with this book will begin to change us in a miraculous way and we're thankful Father that it's profitable because it comes from you We're thankful it helps us to develop our mental lines, our mental boundaries, that we determine what we will and we won't do. Father, we need those lines. Father, the lines have always been under attack. Father, I fear we live in a day and age where there are no lines. The lines are just disappearing. Shame on us. Father, there may be an area today in our lives that we need to develop lines. Help us, Lord, to be obedient to do that. Father, help us to have those lines before we face our next temptation situation. Because, Lord, if we don't, we're going to fall prey to that temptation. Again, I am thankful that we are in a relationship where we can openly talk about truth. All aspects of it, dear God. The four that are mentioned in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Father, I know that I am uh, blessed as a pastor to be able to do that to have people who want to hear truth. And Father, bless these folks for the desire to hear truth in their lives this morning. Again, Lord, we have a busy week coming up. And I just pray that we be able to use our time efficiently and the investments that we make this week in your service would yield eternal results. We ask these things now, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. Good day.